In games, it's really easy to get caught up in trying to be the best, the most powerful. Games are competitive by their very nature, after all. Games are also cooperative, which we shouldn't downplay that, but the situation, the force of having multiple people competing together is a very powerful driver. Dungeons and Dragons and other tabletop RPGs have something a little bit different going on though. Yes, the game does feel competitive, but there's something more. Now, of course you can play things differently. Like you could play D&D as a PvP style arena, or you could play this DM versus the players where everybody, the DM included, follows very explicit, strict rules, and you create this uh, competitive style of D&D. But that is not typical. Neither of these situations, neither the PvP arena nor the players versus the DM are typical styles. 99% uh, of games are not that. But nonetheless, at moments, D&D can feel competitive, and it should. When you are immersed in a world of fantasy and adventure, you feel the struggle to survive and to succeed and to grow and develop. Uh, you want your character, especially when you get invested into your character, you want the character to live and to thrive and to go on, you know, to have victories and then go on to the next chapter or the next scene or the next adventure. Yet when we take a step back and we look at things from a more objective standpoint, D&D is actually not a competitive game. It's a kind of shared storytelling experience. And so you don't really win D&D in the way that you win most other games. As best as I can tell, winning D&D is something like having fun, developing creative talents, developing social skills, creating shared memories that will stay with you forever, exploring the nature of human existence, and connecting with the great heritage of culture and mythology. When understood in this way, I can see why the hell I would do something crazy like play a character with a six constitution score. Because for me, the question was, what's better, powerful or interesting? In my campaigns, we do something pretty standard when you're generating a new character. You roll for the ability scores. You roll 4d6, drop the lowest, and you do that six times until you generate these six numbers. And then you take these six scores and you assign them where you see fit to create your character. We do have two slight house rules in my campaigns though. First of all, the lowest that an ability score can be is a six. So if you get under a total of a six, it becomes just a six. And second, after generating the six scores, you total up all the modifiers. And if they're between plus three and plus eight, it's fine. If it's below a plus three, you adjust some of the scores till it gets up to plus three. If it's above a plus eight, you adjust some of the scores down until it comes down to a plus eight. So this still allows for a ton of variability. It just helps to prevent characters that are absurdly underpowered or absurdly overpowered in terms of their ability scores. So speaking of allowing for a ton of variability, I rolled low on a recent character that I created. That's right, I actually got to play a character. I had just recently concluded an epic campaign of mine that spanned two and a half years and went all the way to level 20. So I was looking to have a little breather and actually get to play a character for a little bit. So my longtime friend and fellow gamer, for anonymity's sake, let's call him Flevin, he offered to run a mini campaign in which me and the other players were happy to go along with. I decided I wanted to play an Arcana Domain cleric who was an archeologist and worshiped the god Illus the Lantern, a god of light and knowledge from my setting of Ikoria. My setting Ikoria. Upon rolling ability scores, here's what I came up with. So actually I realized just now that the total of my modifiers was actually plus two, so uh, oops. Anyhow, I thought about how I would assign those scores. In particular, I was interested in where I would put that six. I always see a low score as a role-playing opportunity. Ability scores are more than just numbers on a page. They are part of who your character is. 
You know, because this is a role-playing game. It's more than just a dice-rolling tactical miniatures game. So let's see, where to put the six? Strength is a possible candidate. I could be a scrawny bookworm type. Hmm, maybe. Dexterity of six would make me a clumsy and bumbling guy. Not quite what I had imagined for an archaeologist who recovers dusty relics from ancient ruins. Constitution of six? <laughs> ah, get out of here. Come on, who would ever do that? That's crazy. Intelligence six would make me dumb as an ogre, which does not fit my archaeologist theme, nor my arcana cleric theme. Wisdom of six would prevent me from even playing a cleric, so obviously no there. Charisma of six would make me extremely reserved, timid, or just unlikable. I would have very limited social skills and be unfit as a leader who relies on communication skills, so and eh, no, that doesn't really fit. So I'm looking at like strength, right? That's what I'm supposed to do. Right? Then I thought about the current times that we find ourselves in. You know, the plague times. And I look around and I see that we're all memeing and we're all patting ourselves on the back. But underneath that all, we are terrified. Eventually you have to shut off your phone and your computer and lie down in the dark to go to sleep. And that's when it will hit you that's when you will realize that you are just this little vulnerable human being that's full of flaws and defects and inconsistencies and emotions. Emotions like fear. What if I get sick? What if I agonize and I have a terrible time of it? What if I die? What if I infect other people and they die? No amount of memes will solve this dread. So what can you do? Well, I don't know exactly, but I do know that if you face your fears, little by little, you get stronger and you develop your courage. And one way to face your fears is to actually run them through this wonderful simulator that we have called an imagination. And that's one of the great benefits of D&D is that it allows us to explore and imagine and test and take on these terrible risks that otherwise would be gambling with our very lives in the real world. And even through running fears solely through the simulator of your imagination, you slowly tone down a little bit the alert system of your body and your mind, AKA anxiety. So I did it. I put the six in constitution because my character Alarcon was suffering from a mysterious disease. Was this a bad idea? No, it was a great idea that just happens to be extremely dangerous. But it was a nice challenge for me. I was going to have to alter my tactics and my strategies a lot to account for the fact that I couldn't really sustain much damage. Also, it was going to give me a very powerful motivator for my character that he is seeking and searching for a cure to this mysterious ailment. I needed to find a cure for this affliction that was threatening to wither me away from the inside. So factoring in my ability score bonuses from Variant Human, which should just be called Human, by the way, I ended up with the following array. So the campaign kicked off and our character, along with a bunch of NPCs, were on a ship sailing, returning back to Bazagon, that glorious bastion of civilization, when we were hit by a maelstrom and we were shipwrecked on a jungle island that was full of aquatic goblinoids and dinosaurs and tribal folk islanders. Oh, and there was also ruins of a bygone era in which the islanders used to worship demons. Also, beyond all of this, we discovered that there was a looming threat hovering over the whole island, or rather island chain, called the Reavers, which was a group of undead that had been around for quite some time. And they also were said to be in possession of a ship 
an eerie and gruesome ship. So Alarcon and the rest of the party and the NPCs were shipwrecked on these islands and we didn't have much gear and we were trying to survive and trying to figure out a way to get back to Bazagon. And all of us and all the NPCs, of course, had all of our different motivations and personalities, but we had this unifying goal or objective of getting back to civilization, getting back home to Bazagon. And Alarcon, of course, was afflicted by this disease, and at times I role-played this by having him going into fits of hacking and coughing, and he would talk about the, the illness. And did I mention that his hit points were really low? When I hit second level, I rolled my d8 hit die, got a four, minus two, which increased my maximum hit points by two. And we decided right then, okay, so the minimum that you could get when you roll a hit die uh, at level up was an increase of one to your maximum hit points. Like you can't get less, you can't lose maximum hit points from gaining a level. I don't know if that's actually an official rule in the books, but uh, it made a lot of sense to us. As a character, damage was not my focus. I had a bit of it. I had the create bonfire cantrip, the magic missile spell by merit of the arcana domain, and uh, a hammer, this hefty kind of sledgehammer thing that I'd gotten from my father, who was also an archeologist, and it was an item that was of personal, it had sentimental value to me. It was a D8 two-handed bludgeoning simple weapon. But really damage was not my main thing. Um, I had a lot of support and healing, things like guidance, bless, cure wounds, sanctuary, lesser restoration. And then I had some other control type effects. Um, I had like um, the blindness spell and I had minor illusion for uh, some trickery. Oh, I also had one of the most creative cantrips I've ever seen. I really loved this one, Mold Earth out of Xanathar's Guide. Which, by the way, DM Flevin constantly reminded me that I was using it incorrectly and no, it won't work for that and no, it won't work for this and no, you cannot create a sanctum, a, a minor shrine to Illus the Lantern there at the beach using Mold Earth, which I insisted over and over that I did indeed create my sanctuary. Here, I even drew it. So, you know, if a player goes so far as to actually draw something out, then of course that means that it does legitimately function in the game. Skills were also a strong point of mine. I had a bunch of different skills by way of the character that I made, and I used them a lot during the three levels of play that the mini campaign spanned. And beyond all of that, Alarcon was the wisest character of the group, and he would often offer guidance and religious counsel and words of wisdom, which leads us to... Alarcon did not trust one of the NPCs. She had this subtle and slightly manipulative way about her that just smelled really fishy to me. And she was a tiefling, which in my book, tieflings are guilty until proven innocent. I mean, look at them. They're literally devil people. If you play a tiefling, great, go for it. But play a tiefling because you like the conflict of people everywhere being suspicious of you. You want a sense of overcoming a stain upon your whole race to prove yourself as trustworthy and competent. I mean, that's how life is anyway. If you expect the whole world to just accommodate you, you're in for a big surprise. Life is here to shatter you. And then it's up to you if you just wallow among the fragments or if you pick yourself back up and you rebuild something that's even bigger and greater than before. And from a writing perspective alone, inner conflict is like the best thing to write about. It's one of the best motivators and driving forces in all of storytelling. And a tiefling has a bunch of inner conflict, potentially, built right into the race. Anyhow, tiefling tangent aside, Alarcon mistrusted the sly devil woman. I actually told my allies that I suspected her of being a succubus. Well, one night, my companion Argentus the Sorcerer had an oh-so-lovely conversation with said beguiling NPC, and he was hot on the idea of accepting her invitation to go off alone with her to spend some special time there, in a, her corner of our scavenger camp on the beach. He was quite enthused about the lusty prospect, and uh, he was charmed. Yeah, his, his character was charmed. I advised him not to go, Alarcon said. No, Argentus. 
Do not go with the She-Devil. She harbors a dark secret. It could lead to your destruction. It might lead to our destruction. I warned him of all this, and I said, let's expose her, and if needs be, let's engage her in conflict and strike down this fiend. Alarcon was most devout in his worship of Illus, and he was staunchly, adamantly opposed to undead and fiends. Argentus the sorcerer, however, ignored my words of wisdom, and he decided to go have his rendezvous with the she-devil, and then the whole scene eventually broke out into a fight as the tiefling was trying to do some kind of diabolic ritual and sacrifice people in a fire, and then Argentus charmed actually took her side in this and uh for a second there it looked pretty grim but we managed to pull out a victory in the end and we managed to strike down the tiefling who luckily turned out not to be a succubus just a good old-fashioned infernal cultist who worshipped devils or was in league with devils argentus came back to his senses and i had my i told you so moment a session or two later, our party explored the aforementioned ruins on the island where the tribal folk once practiced demonic rites many generations ago. We fought some minor demons and a few kobolds and some demonically tainted kobolds. Within a vault, Kylan the ranger found a short sword fashioned with demon-like stylization. My detect magic and arcana skill determined that it indeed was a demonic magic short sword, and I strongly advised Kaelin and the whole party to not touch the thing. Demonic relics and ancient evil temples are not the kind of thing that you want to play around with. Kylan's eyes widened in lustful greed, and he snatched up the sword, and lo and behold, it indeed was a cursed short sword, which then fueled his bloodlust and his rage and even whispered and rasped in his mind, telling him to slay and spill blood and kill. So as before, my words of wisdom and my sound advice was ignored. But to be fair, it also did lead again to some more tension and storytelling. We eventually found a cove on the north end of the island and managed to defeat the Reavers there, the undead faction, and we actually used some pretty sound tactics, I would say. They were lesser undead, like skeletons, shadows, ghouls, and a white. Their ship was anchored in the shallows, and at its prow was a warped lantern shedding a fell green light, a twisted mockery of my god, Illus the Lantern. The shipmaster appeared, who was a Marinoloth, which if you're not familiar with, this is actually one of the coolest fiends in all of 5e, which scored incredibly high on my fiends ranking video. They are inspired by Charon, the ferryman of the river Styx in classical mythology. So this fiendish shipmaster said that he would give us passage back to Bazagon for the price of either a sacrifice a person to the ship and therefore their soul is going to be bound to the ship or to that lantern and they are going to serve as an undead thrall like an undead crew member or warrior the likes of which we just fought or b make a blood pact with the Myrnaloth yourself and you actually serve as a crew member on this wicked ship for uh, i think kind of an unspecified amount of time or serve until he gotten his next uh, diabolic goal fulfilled. So while the other party members were debating how they might make this deal, which option they were going to choose, uh, I was staunchly opposed to the entire thing. Um, it was completely contrary to everything that my character stood for. The ship was a mockery of my god, the captain was a fiend, and in order to board the ship and get passage on it, I would have to either commit human sacrifice or I myself would have to enter into a blood pact. I would have to bind my soul in service of this fiend and its wicked ship that blasphemed my beliefs and my religion. So on every level, this absolutely did not work for me. It was contrary to my entire being. I tried explaining to my party that this was a foul, evil, corrupt, rotten deal that would only lead to horrible consequences, but in true form, they dismissed my guidance. Having been pushed to his limit, Alarcon declared that he would rather die than obey the demands of this fiend, and I went on the offensive. At that moment, Kylan the Ranger, possessed by the demon sword, declared that he was to attack me. 
The situation looked pretty grim at that point, but luckily Argentus the sorcerer persuaded everyone to settle their boiling blood and to try to come up with another solution. He and I went off a ways to talk, just the two of us, and he suggested that I take the fiend's deal, but try to use it against him with a later trick or reversal or revenge of some sort. Such ideas were absolutely off the table for me, and I said that I would return to the Islander's village and try to find another way. Even if it involved me trying to wrangle a pterodactyl, you know, something as crazy as that was preferable to condemning my eternal soul. I would rather risk the island, the dinosaurs, the disease, all of that, than betray my god. Argentus said that he would try to find a way to come back and rescue me at a later time, and I thanked him for that, and I backtracked to go back to where the shipwreck NPCs had been waiting on us while we were fighting the Reavers there at the Cove battle. Oh, I forgot to mention another idea of mine that had gotten shot down by Flevin the DM. I had suggested to the tribesfolk that they construct a larger or otherwise more seaworthy type of watercraft which we could then use that to try to get back to Bazagon. And without so much as even having a single NPC hear me out, without giving a chance for me to roll a knowledge check, a, some kind of check to examine the boats that the Islanders had and see a way to potentially upgrade them, uh, to a check to persuade them, nothing. Flebin himself said, there was no way the tribe could build such a boat. They could only build these little canoes that could do nothing more than get around the shallows and the nearby islets. You know, because it's impossible to even attempt to build low-tech boats that could travel more than a couple hundred miles. So back to the action of the ship. At this point, Kalen the ranger decided that he'd had enough of my willfulness, and he sent his animal companion, Panther, to go and fetch me. The jungle cat came bounding up to me. It grabbed me in its mouth and began dragging me back towards the ship. My allies, Argentus the sorcerer and Jean the wizard, said, Bad kitty, and smote the beast with their magics. I continued my escape. When I reached the NPCs, I told them that the ship was a cursed vessel with a demon master, and do not go there. If you go, you will find fiendish corruption and probably horrible doom. Every single one of the NPCs ignored my advice. They all went to the ship, where a dumpster fire of a scene erupted. First, the characters actually had made blood packs with the Marinoloth. And then the NPCs arrived, and Kalen, the demon-possessed ranger, changed his mind and murdered an NPC to pay for his toll. Alden, the, as best I could tell, warlock paladin, then attacked Kalen and ended up killing him. And when he died, transformed into a skeletal thrall, bound to the service of the ship and to the fiendish captain. Actually, by the end of the scene, all of the NPCs, these NPCs that we had been shipwrecked with, struggled and survived with, developed some amounts of uh, relationships and interactions and dynamics with them, gone through an ordeal together, all of them got murdered as the blood tolls to the Ship of Horrors. All except one, I uh, can't remember his name, is a Weasley guy with a shady trade deal of some variety that proved to be lucrative for everyone once they made it back to Bazagon. Flevin, the DM, gave a epilogue to the mini campaign which described the various profits the characters made from helping Mr. Shady back to the big city. My fate was different. Flevin said that my character made it back to the Islander's village indeed, but my sickness quickly grew worse and I died after two days. That's right, my backstory killed me. Well, actually one of the great things about D&D is that a backstory doesn't have to be just a backstory. It doesn't have to be just a few paragraphs that you wrote before the campaign and no one reads it, but rather it can be a continuation that plays out real time in game. It's backstory plus current story, which is amazing because it makes things real. It makes things actually matter. 
In Flevin's case, he had utilized my backstory to provide a tense situational dilemma. Either betray everything that I stand for and send myself to hell, or die of the disease. As Alarcon himself said, I would rather die than condemn my soul. And that's what happened. Flevin did describe my soul reaching the afterlife and being welcomed by the glorious ranks of the Exalted of Illus. So in the end, I suppose Alarcon did win D&D. Not through some thrilling challenge of victory in battle, or making my way to Mount Doom and tossing the One Ring into the fires, but through me consistently role-playing my character, having him stick to his beliefs and his vows. Instead of the brave trek to Mount Doom, all I had to do was refuse to go to Mount Doom. I didn't learn anything new or have a character arc. I just had to accept the terror of death instead of choosing a momentary convenience of the ship's passage that would ultimately lead to eternal damnation. But I can accept all of that. Sure, it would have been cool to have gotten more out of the campaign or had some great character development personal challenge moment. Uh, but what did happen, Alarcon's death and ascension to his afterlife, did give a sense of depth and weight and meaning to the setting. It gave us a sense of a greater cosmology, so that in and of itself I think is pretty valuable. The one thing that doesn't sit well with me is how everyone ignored Alarcon's words of wisdom. He was the wise one of the party, the cleric, the priest, the, the guide, the counselor, and yet Every single character and NPC, without fail, ignored his guidance. Now, I understand that in a campaign, you know, probably one or two of the characters are going to be these wild hearts, or maybe they're just completely foolhardy, and maybe some of the NPCs are going to be erratic or brash or reckless buffoons, but all of them? Everyone, everyone wants to tear everything down and revel in the chaos. Okay. You could say this comes down to a matter of DMing styles. And yes, I think that is true, at least to some degree that is true. You know, one style has this very specific story in mind that doesn't really have a lot of room to be altered. And you know, once you start going down that track of making things more open-ended, uh, you know, maybe you're going to be spending a lot more time prepping things, and of course, you know, everything that you prepare isn't even going to get used, so you feel like maybe you're kind of wasting time. Uh, of course, you can counter that by saying, improvise, you know, don't worry about uh, laboring over extensive amounts of notes and preparation, but rather just uh, be flexible and available to roll with the punches and the curveballs and the twists that come up, the, the crazy things that the characters come up with. Now, I do think it is okay to say no sometimes, especially when saying no helps preserve the internal consistency of your campaign, of your setting. Uh, can I play a gnome gunslinger in our swords and sorcery campaign? No, but more often than not, it's actually better to say yes even if you're saying yes to an idea that you're not immediately sure how you're even going to respond to it. Uh, saying yes to something that is a twist in your preconceived idea or your pre-written, predestined notion that's also precious to you, uh, if you allow this, it sometimes can actually end up bringing about something more interesting in the story and in the game, something that you couldn't have even foreseen. Sometimes putting a six into your constitution actually ends up giving your character more life. I know that I am never going to forget Alarcon de Letra, and you can bet the five survivors of the island incident are not going to forget him either. They're going to sit pretty for now on their gold, and they're going to write out their wealth, and they're going to think that they are winners. But the night will come when they will awaken from the grips of a nightmare and they will open the shutters to get some fresh air and see there in the sky the constellation of the lantern and there one of the stars winking at them as though to say I know what sins you have committed so those are some things to think about I hope that you've gotten something out of this video thank you very much for watching 
please subscribe. You can also check me out on Patreon where I create all kinds of different stuff. I've got all the links down in the dungeon of the video. And as always, may your adventures be many.